What's up, legends? It's Blake from the Sports Medicine Project. And Kelly. We are back today. We're just going to do a quick intro. We've got Dave again for part two. And we had, you know, a lot of a lot of good feedback on that first one. And you guys, you know, saying that you haven't heard anyone really talk about pain like that before, which is good. And that's exactly why we wanted to get him on, because he's a weapon. And yeah, you just don't get access to people like that um, too often. So yeah, it was awesome. So we're going to talk about, as always, what annoyed us, what we learnt. Kelly, what did you learn? Uh, not necessarily what I learnt this week, but we went down to the New Run Festival this morning and I was just so inspired by everyone there running so far and there's so many people there and just everyone had trained for that and it was just so inspiring. So yeah. I just thought I'd use that one. Nice. Yeah, there was like over a thousand people. Kelly didn't race, but I did the 10K um, and yeah, it was just in, like there were 485 people that did the 10k which is just wild and then obviously the, the half and the marathon is probably more popular so inspiring yeah people are awesome people and people are, are, so are resilient cool. and mm. strong and capable they're not dysfunctional no. yeah so what what annoyed you then uh i just went for a bike ride and was stopped at a traffic light and went to go and then some car just ran into the back of me and yeah gave me well a big bump. i was okay <laughs> They just bumped into me. Give it a like, little bit of context. Oh, How I was... Wait, what? Well, like, you weren't going... Like, the car wasn't going 120 No, no, no. Hour. I was stopped at a traffic light, and I was turning right, and I went to go, and then a car just went bang. Bang, yeah. I so was okay, though. Kelly I didn't, didn't fall, fall off. I didn't fall off. I was okay. Just don't be on your phone when you're driving. Yeah, don't hit cyclists. Come on. We're just trying to... Yeah, I know we suck. We wear Lycra. I know you all hate us, but... <laughs> yeah, on. some of us are out there trying to do the right <laughs> we thing. We don't want to die. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I mean. That's what my... I always say this, and I probably more bike I talk about it with cyclists. Like, you know, when cars drive close or yell out or, or try and scare you, like... I mean, I just don't think... Imagine if you actually hit someone because you were trying to, you know, be a hero or, or scare a cyclist and mm-hmm. you actually killed them or, or something terrible happened. Imagine having to confront their family, the police or report and say, oh, you know, there was this cyclist and I didn't give him much room and then, you know, I thought I'd get a little mm-hmm. bit close to scare him and then I hit him and he fell off and now he's a paraplegic. Like, can you imagine that? Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. yeah, I hope you're all thinking that. <laughs> so I learnt this week a lot about so I don't know if you guys know but I lecture in biomechanics at Newcastle University to to final year students and this week's lecture was on kinetics and you know I thought I I did know a fair bit about biomechanics but just you know as you're teaching it and learning it you've, you've got to understand it pretty well because you get asked you know so many different questions about different topics so you've got to be able to explain it I think simply and in a complex way and the amount of, so kinetic is, is basically just force that you can't see. So ground reaction force and force acting on our body. Gravity is a kinetic force. We've got muscles and ligaments inside our body that generate kinetic force. And the body is just insane. And like when people say, you know, the biomechanics of heel strike versus forefoot strike, that that's not biomechanics. Like really, truly biomechanics, I think, is, you know, for an example, when you go into maximum hip flexion, you've got internal extensors that generate a force in the opposite direction and those two forces basically are not equal but they power to each other and then it's the flexor or the internal flexor moment that generates more force than the internal extensor moment. And just like all these levers and it was just incredible. It's really interesting and I think it you would never be able to explain this to a patient or to people or have them understand that so I, I do get that but yeah, just be... I think be careful when you're talking about biomechanics in depth because real biomechanists would then talk about it like this. So, And I would say I'm probably maybe in the medium. What would you call not medium, not advanced, intermediary understanding maybe, maybe even novice and like real biomechanists are like advanced. So, but how relevant is it? I mean, and when we're talking about rehab and injuries and health professionals looking at mm. how to make their patients better and overcome their injuries, mm. how relevant is it anyway? It's not that relevant to explain to patients. And I don't know how relevant it is for us to understand, but you've got to have the basis of something to build. Like to know where the ground reaction force goes with your heel strike, people have to go into this amount of depth to be able to simplify it. 
Do you know what I mean? It's definitely not relevant to explain the patient. And for you and I talking, I would never talk like that because you're like, what the hell? And you're trying to think about it in your head and you say something wrong. And it's, I think it's relevant to have a, a basis. Same as like, you know, do we have to understand the cell morphology in a tendon when we're loading it? We probably don't. The patient doesn't really need to. But for us to develop or research to develop their protocols, they probably do have to have an understanding. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Wow. That was pretty easy. Kelly disagreed. I've never seen you agree like that. <laughs> I'm on a roll with my... I, the, the thing that sold me was the, the talk about tendons because I think that that's, that helps me understand, you know, where... Yeah, but you would never say, no. you know, there's more tenocytes or, or whatever in, mm. in the tendon when you stretch it. The thing that annoyed me was a... Oh, that's right. So the thing that annoyed me, we had a patient go to athlete's foot we'd written down we sent them to athlete's foot because of the selection that they have there and i would undoubtedly send them to the running shop here um in cooks hill shout out to pure performance because they're great there it's a personal fitting and if we say something to put them in i mean they know everything that they need to know and they're great but sometimes we like want a specific shoe which is not all the time but yeah we sent this guy to athlete's foot um, I'm trying to think of the pathology. It was, oh, yeah, he'd had like an IPJ deformity and it was getting like a, a toe or a trigger, trigger hallux and it was just sitting up and, and getting some pain and a high pressure area under the first MPJ. And we just wanted a neutral shoe for an orthotic to fit in there. Come back with a Brooks Beast and the person, he said that the person was like, you need to do this and this shoe's better and you can definitely bring it back but I think this is right and get you on the walking machine which is absolute crap and it's just marketing but yeah it came back with the wrong shoe and we just can't use the shoe because it's too much to control he already feels like he's being pushed laterally which we're kind of trying to do but we don't want to tip him laterally he's older I think like over the 50s but you know if someone's recommending something just go off that and if it doesn't work you know wait and, and get something else but yeah that annoyed me from athlete's foot I understand they're a big company they've got their marketing things they probably don't care what, what I'm saying but yeah that just turns me off referring to them and I know as a whole podiatrist would definitely send a lot to them so yeah that was us for the week now listen through to this episode and you know what listen to the whole thing i'm check i can check now on spotify i've got the catalog and i can see exactly where you cut off and it actually gives me your name number and your address i will call all of you and tell you listen to the end of it it's an awesome episode and it's great if you can explain pain i understand it you're going to be a better clinician if someone said to me mm. and in it in in the way that and no nah. <laughs> here you go <laughs> Um, it's just a very different approach, I think, how Dave sort of discusses it and explains it. Previously, I know that I've sort of gone textbook, explain pain, you know, this is this is what we need which to do. Which is great. Which is also good. Mm. But it some like that patients don't always care about that. I think it I think Dave um, has a really good way of making it relevant to the patient and what they actually need to know to get them better. Yeah, like we care about it. Kelly and I really care about it because we find that stuff enjoyable. But, yeah. you know, your runner that wants to run on the weekend, they don't care about what's happening in their brain and how yeah, they it They don't how need it... to know the biomechanics and the ground reactions. Yeah, they, they just don't need, they to, just know need to know it. Know some some do, better. don't get me wrong, some do. And it's great to explain that. And to the patients that do, I I love you because <laughs> it really, it just, it's nice to have those conversations. Fire. Yeah. But, mm. one, like, we were just, you know, editing it and listening to one thing about the dry needling thing. And I guess all therapies, we were saying that, or sorry, Dave was saying patients think therapies work because the clinician has kind of bestowed what, the last what they think onto them. Yeah, I was just, when I was editing it and finding the halfway point. Mm. So, yeah, I do all the editing and all the work on this podcast. Kelly doesn't do anything. Anyway. Whatever, I'm all over the social media. <laughs> so, yeah, he was saying that, you know, we put that experience onto them. So, like, yeah, you definitely need this needling. So, they think that they need it. If you didn't mention needling, they probably have no idea. So, mm. have a think about that. And, yeah, listen to this episode and we'll talk to you guys next week. Catch you later. They want the effect of needling. So if I can provide that effect with something else that doesn't involve being stabbed, I've never had anyone say, no, you have to stab me.
I mean, again, I'm being flippant, but and then people what you- want the effect of something. So if you can get the effect, then great. And and my little caveat to that is that most people's experience with dry needling has been generated by a therapist. Oh, you've got a calf problem. These will be really good for you. Insert needle has an effect. Therefore, the patient goes, well, obviously it was the needles. Yeah. It came that, after. Yeah, there were a lot. So like, were most like- of that effect that people attribute to it has been generated by us, not by them. Mm-hmm. So when therapists say that patients want it, I'm like, yeah, but they only want it because you told them that they need it. If you don't tell them that they need it, Whoa. no one wants it. I'm pumped up now. I feel like I'm getting a lot out of this. <laughs> um, Dave, so I guess moving a little bit away from that, what what are the sort of biggest mistakes that you think clinicians make when managing chronic pain patients? Or just pain patients. Or any, any pain, but particularly chronic pain, because I think that's where most of the error, well, that's how they evolve into a chronic pain situation, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe one of them is they treat them differently. So... Is it any different with a chronic pain? What's a chronic pain patient? Mm. Someone who's had pain for more than three months. I treat them differently. I'm saying I treat them differently. I'm not going to lie. So so what is it? What is it about? Let's let's. I'm. This might be only audio, so you might not see my awesome um, (laughs) inverted commas. So I'll I'll, or inverted commas. What's a chronic pain inverted commas patient? Yeah, yeah. I, I just. What makes you treat them differently? And what is it that you pick out, particularly before you speak to them, that, that goes, oh, I'm going to have to treat this person differently? Yeah. And I've, I've just had the realisation that I probably shouldn't be doing that. I, it's just if I identify psychosocial factors, I think that I should be going a little bit more into, um, <laughs> say, the pain science, but a little bit more into, I guess, how they experience pain, the changes, some of the changes that they can get as well as what could be contributing to their pain. And there's only a certain number of factors that I can address. So I always say, like my big three, especially being, being a podiatrist, it might be stress, sleep, nutrition, relationships, and biomechanics. I can probably have a bit of, bit of a go at their biomechanics, which may address their pain for you know right now or in the short or the long term. But there's other factors that also contribute. So I knowing that and i want them to understand that i'm probably going to go into more into that into the first appointment rather than Uh, someone who's uh snapped their achilles so you know why it hurts it's pretty obvious yes but yeah i just i i feel as though there's just more layers to peel back with patients who have been pushed around the medical system a little bit so it's not necessarily that the treatment itself is different but perhaps the the way in which you get there might be different does that make sense? And I focus on things first. Like I, yes, we do an assessment as we always do and, you know, try and rule out anything serious and underlying. But if I identify those factors to me, and again, I'm very happy to be wrong. I think that they may need to hear it on the first appointment because most likely I'm going to have to consistently give this, give this, give them this information because they're not going to take it all in on the first appointment. So if I wait until the fifth, and I don't want to start the fifth appointment and then start talking about pain, rather start now. That may, yeah. So, so if they have a sprained ankle, so, so let me go back to the Achilles yeah. thing first. So, so when they've snapped their Achilles and you're the one that tells them, mm-hmm. um, are they going to have some psychosocial worries about that? Yes, which, I'll, which I will explain that those, and I, the Greg Lehman cut, I've overused it. I reckon I should be paying this guy royalties. How many times? Well, I've- Greg will tell you, it's not his. He got it from someone else. It's the same as in music. There's nothing new since the Beatles, and even the Beatles stole it from Buddy Holly. So. As if, Greg, it's pretty um, influential. But anyway, talk about music. And Lee Kernigan is pretty good too, in, in country listeners. But... Their experience, <laughs> their, if they do snap their Achilles, their experience of pain after that is going to be affected by all these other factors, which I think is worth for them understanding. So, yeah. So what's the why? Why? What's the difference? Why would? So you just said with a chronic pain, inverted commas, chronic pain patient, you'll spend more time going through that. Yeah. Because you're, I, not, you're not going to do anything at all for a snap Achilles. No. You're not going to treat it. But I think I can get if I can explain those factors and hopefully they understand that 
you know, in a couple of weeks when they have a really, really, and I'll explain, you know, there's good days and bad days and you getting better isn't linear. And let's say, I'm not, obviously not going to see them too regularly. I might say, I'll oh, see in the next week, you might have a really bad day on Tuesday. And if I've given them the example of, hey, it could be slept badly, stress, relationships, something like that, they might think, oh, I'm in pain right now and it's worse than what it was yesterday. But oh, Blake said that these other psychosocial factors affect my experience of pain. So I think that gives them a little bit of confidence compared to someone that's come in and injured their perineal doing a trail run. I don't think it's as important. So I think that answers your question. You just said that you don't think it's as important. Yeah. Well, I think what you think probably doesn't matter as much as what they think. So yeah. the, the previous story that you just, just said then, was mm. that the chronic pain person or was that the Achilles? That's what I was thinking. I, I didn't even know which one you were talking it about. It could have been head, 100% either one. Yeah. yeah. There, so there is, no, there is no difference. There is no... So then your other... Uh, back to your other example, when you were saying um, that if you don't go through it on the first yes, yes, yes. session, yeah. you go through it on the fifth session, would you ever tell someone with a sprained ankle what they've done on the fifth session? No. So you'd tell them what it is on the first session? Yeah. So what's the difference? I don't think that it's as as relevant because I think that... I think, you don't think it's as relevant? You know, I think that the psychosocial factors that they have, depending on... It's just if I identify that patient to perhaps be... But you're not explaining their pain as their as the psychosocial factors. Mm. Like you're explaining their their problem through other examples, I guess. Not just saying that their pain is purely from the sake of not sleeping well and having a poor mm. relationship. But I think they're just gonna like that Achilles patient. If, if they're gonna be probably in pain for a lot longer than someone that just injured their perineal on a trail run, I can't predict that, but I can be confident. Mm. So I'm more likely to give it to them because I think they're probably going to be, I guess you could say I judge someone or I give them a risk percentage as to how much I think that psychosocial factors are going to affect them, which again, there's no evidence to base that off. And I also give them a category of how much do I think they'll benefit? If I really, really think they'll benefit from me explaining all this pain stuff, I will give it to them. Whereas someone comes in with a parent I'm like, oh, you, you probably don't need this, I don't think. I think you've just got to be careful predicting what yeah, happens with is, humans. Yeah, I definitely can't predict. It's Yeah, I can't predict that at all with any certainty. You can, but you're, you're the clinician. You're the expert in that problem. Mm -hmm. You're just not the expert in them and how they experience that problem. So it's not, this, this is where I think uh, particularly newer grads get into trouble where they, it, they have to make this nihilistic determination between it's always yeah talk about feelings or it's never talk about feelings yes you know what what if what if each person fitted on some continuum somewhere and you have to pick where to start it's like okay it's a it's a runner with an angry perineal tendon do i need to ask them about their job and their menstrual cycle and their relationship with their father yeah maybe not at the start if it's not going well mm. do i do I talk about that at some point? Maybe. So, but just the same thing. Like if, if someone has chronic back pain and you start with you're stressed and you're not sleeping, what do you think they, yeah. like this guy just told me that it, it, my 10 years of back pain is because I'm not sleeping. I'm not sleeping because my fucking back hurts, Blake. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's, all, it's everything all the time. Yeah. You, where the skill is, is what does this person need from all the shit that I know? What do they need now to help them understand that I get where they're, where they are mm. and that this is what we're going to do next. Yeah. So what do they need now? And then maybe what do they need next? So it's when you start, I, I very naturally recoil against categorization. I think, I think it's handy mm. and I think having some sort of framework is useful um but but maybe a different i had a good chat to um dave moen the other day from form physio and i uh, developed permission to move and he categorizes them as pain makes uh pain's better with movement pain is worse with movement uh movement has no effect on my pain and there was i can't remember the fourth one so i'm like 
that makes sense. It's like, okay, so we're going to do this because you're there, but categorizing them as you're more psycho and you're more social and you're more bio, I, mm-hmm. I find that hard to yeah, justify. Always got the blend. I guess yep. to, yeah. to like move on from that, like how relevant do you think pathology is when you are explaining in those first few appointments and, you know, peeling back layers from what they've heard previously how much are you going into the pathology that they have been told previously or that they think may be a component of why they're still in pain? Well, this is like pathology matters when it matters. You know, if you've got a spinal tumour, that that's a problem. Uh, it's just that most chronic low back pain is not a spinal tumour. Uh, I guess you're talking about, so it's not ignore pathology. Mm-hmm. And, and it's this, again, this is another paradox with imaging. Most people, I mean, I'm almost 40. I've probably got disc bulges and foraminal encroachment and blah, blah, blah. I've never had significant low back pain. You MRI my back, I'll probably have a heap of shit. So if that stuff wasn't there, it would be less likely for me to have back pain. But just because it is there doesn't mean it has to hurt. So it's this paradoxical thing that we have to, we're not discounting it or trivializing it or saying forget about it. Because of course you'd worry about it to your back and it looks like shit on a scan. But, and it feels like shit. So when it looks like shit and feels like shit, they're pretty obvious that they're one and the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to pull apart that your structure and your pain and your function are different. They're related, but they're different. So we can get, I can't help you with your discs, but I can absolutely, your body might help you with your discs if we get you doing some cool shit, but I can help you with your pain and I can help you with the function. Mm. How do you go about explaining the difference between what you see on x-ray um, and, and their symptoms. Like so if, you start with, you've got to start with, again, who, who am I talking about? Like you can't have hmm. recipe-based, this is what I do about a disc bulge or, you know, it's what do they think about it? Who's explained it to them? And I hope the best answer there is I've got no idea because then you can go, great. Let's not, there's nothing on that that I'm too concerned about. If you're happy with that, let's crack on with making it feel better. Yeah. There's a few things there that, and see, I'm a lot older than you too, so it's easy for me. I can say, look, my beard is gray and there's wrinkles on my face <laughs> and I'm not as pretty as I used to be, but that's all right. You know, I'm, I'm almost 40. I'm not 20 anymore. So, you know, you scan my face and you could say that I'm degenerate, but I'm like, shut up. I'm just, you know, a silver Fox. There's difference. So, so it's, if, if they don't have any concept of it, then, then let's not go into it too deeply. But mm-hmm. if they've been told that it's the cause of their back pain, then you have to unpack that with creating doubt around, how do they know that, that that's going to happen? You know, yeah. so, yeah. And, and there's a correlation between how many different health professionals they've, they've seen and how bad they think their scans are. There's no doubt about that. You think it's people just do it because it's easier? Like it's easier for someone to say, this is bone on bone or it's just, it's wear and tear. The body's like a car. You put that many miles on it, bound to break down. That's like, a pretty powerful social construct, the wear and tear thing. Like that's, that exists everywhere. Yeah. You know, like even, even it's funny, like, uh, so I, I lift weights. I'm not, I'm no Olympic weightlifter, but I lift weights. My wife's a pretty keen runner. My mum is going, why are you doing that? You're both too old to do that. You're going to hurt yourself. I'm like, I fucking do this for a living, for <laughs> a living, you silly old bitch. So it's like, it's just a pretty powerful social construct that, um, that influences how and then you know she's just trying to she's she her heart's in the right place she's trying to look after me and blah 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 and it's completely wrong and it's probably bad for me mm. yeah. so yeah. you know you're talking about very thick layers of social western social human interaction there do you yeah. think that's a generational thing and that's gonna sort of bleed yeah. out eventually yeah yeah but then we'll have shit that like i'll tell my kids and they're like Shut up, Dad. It's virtual reality. Don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, no, uh, actually, yeah. The worst I like, even on Instagram, you see, and it'll be like someone doing a double leg squat, someone doing a single leg squat, and it'll say why the double leg is so much better. And it'll be something like, you just don't understand the orthopedic cost of doing a single leg, like the cost to your body. And then that just like, two stems from there. It's crazy. Yeah. It, it really well, social media makes that worse, though, because fear is much more transactional than than optimism 
I know. I said, I say this to like, to Justin every day. It'd be so much easier like, just to be not a good clinician and just yeah. say whatever you want. Like, yeah. yeah, that foot's flat, it's bone on bone. Have this orthotic to support your midfoot. It'd be yeah. so much easier. Do you it think, really think it's easier. That there's anything that can possibly change to to change this problem that we have of pain being such a burden? Uh, there's heaps that can change. Absolutely. But I mean, it, it's a, how far do you want to go down? Like chronic low back pain has links with social, socioeconomic status, with education, with uh, racial inequality, with gender inequality, with, you know, any big world problem. Like mm-hmm. if you don't want to be unhealthy, don't be poor. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, so, so if unless you want to get like this is a health podcast if you want to take it into global politics then let's go but um like unless you're going to change the wider western global uber capitalist system then and this is they're the sort of things my brain contemplates on a daily level uh frequency i should say so but i've just tried to focus on the area of that that i can actually change and so, so if i you know if you change we, and we've got pretty good evidence of this. If you help one person with their chronic pain problem and you get them back to meaningful activity, you have improved their wider community and you've improved the next few generations of their family. Oh, that's good. That's so, good. so, and that's not that's not pie in the sky, lefty wannabe hand holding bullshit. Like that's they've they've been able to show that pretty consistently. So. Um, so what do you think that looks like for, for physios to or podiatrists or health professionals to start doing apart from, you know, everything that we've spoken about on the communication and educational level? What else do you think people need to be doing more of when they are managing pain? For m- more things that might help people, less things that don't help people. That would be a good start. Where, um, where do you go to learn this stuff? Like I know there's, I know there's the explain pain. Who does that? Noi. yeah there's explain yeah. pain there's i mean you've got an instagram it's the pain weapon isn't it you've got like 20 mm-hmm. followers don't you <laughs> I don't know, those lines. we've got more on ours but anyway we should do a collab like a pain wow. um anyway we well, yeah, where where would you say like where should people learn about this and i mean there's stuff everywhere but you know generally whether you're not much of an understanding to a great understanding, you know, any people, just even if you rattled off, you know, three names for people to look up. Uh, well, I mean, that's social media is a, is a good outlet for that, but you have to develop a, a pretty good filter mm. to, to critique what you see. So I guess before we get into who, then where would be more important, I think for, for younger clinicians, like if, if you're in an environment where these conversations aren't occurring and, you know, like for example, not that long ago, a young uh, physio contacted me, his, his boss pulled him aside and said, if he ever does a Jefferson curl with a patient again, he'll, he'll like almost, almost have him disbarred, you know, like, oh and I was like, fuck man, I like, how do you, how do you progress, do you progress in that environment? So mm-hmm if you're not in an environment where even the conversation is possible, then that's pretty hard. Um, I'm not suggesting quitting is the answer, but, um, but critiquing, critiquing yourself and where you are and where you're going is a pretty important step. Yeah. Um, because even like this notion of pain experts is a, is a ridiculous one. They're just, they're just people who have been where younger clinicians have been before. So, um, so, but in terms of where to go for, um, no. it, it's tricky though. Like, you, so, so certainly social media is a good place to connect with lots of people who, who delve into it. But then the more you delve into it, you realize that they all disagree with each other anyway. So mm. what, what I would say rather than who to follow is, is how do you develop your sense of getting working out what's closer to the truth and what's not. Mm. Um, and, and that's probably just a time and practice type thing. Yeah. And the framework to think, think about it. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. You just can't, I mean, I had someone message me the other day asking how I read so much research and because I work with the university, I get access to, to the library and it's like, I just had this thought, 
you know, people that don't work within that space, you know, you're not going to pay $30 for a paper. So what's the point of trying to read the research? And then if you do read it, you're just reading the conclusion. And then to understand it as well is another layer of complexity. So yeah, what do you do other than follow, you know, squat you on universe, um, squat you university on Instagram mm. and see what they're, they're doing. So I mean, previous, so, so previous attempts that I've made would be to, to try and become involved at an undergraduate level with physio education that as yet has been unsuccessful. Uh, then try and target recent graduates with, with helping them develop a system of approaching this stuff. Yeah. Um, engage with researchers who, you know, those, those processes are, are what they do day in, day out. And that, that's been massive for me in terms of critiquing my own beliefs about what, what I think is the truth and progress me much faster towards a better way of doing things. So it's, it's just who you, I think, who you surround yourself with and mm. um, that, that constant process of improvement. Yeah. I did want to ask, can I, I've had this trouble in the past. You know, if, if you do, you know, if you have someone come in or you identify that you know it is something quite complex and it's i definitely want to stress and like you were saying if someone wanted to see you for needling it's okay to refer them refer a patient of yours to some someone else or somewhere else if someone did come in that you identify as a little bit more complex or there's a little bit more going on that you might not be able to help them with or address i mean like who do you refer to like obviously not you wouldn't go straight to a pain specialist or do you or you know do you look for a pain physio in your area or what's your recommendation there uh you mean what do i personally do well, well i guess what do you do personally and then what would you say to a clinician in their first mm. four or five years or a student if, if that did happen because it happened in the student clinic last week and i mm. I gave an answer, but I think I could give a better answer, which I'll do this week. Yeah, I think that's where developing your own little network of, of people is is a good idea. Um, I have a network of people that if it was a certain thing, I would get them involved. Um, I'll try and be as PC as I can with this, but I'm, I'm sceptical about intervening for pain. So I would... Uh, that being said, um, so a common, a very common referral point for me is someone who's got really nasty, ridiculous neck pain that's like 60 million out of 10, can't sleep, can't think, torture. Mm. They, they will, if you leave them unsupported, they will get anyone to cut anything out of their neck at the drop of a hat. It's, yeah. it's 24 hours a day torture. So, so I'll often send them very early for an injection, even though most of them don't work because it's that feeling of I'm doing something, this might help its progression mm -hmm. in, in, as they perceive it. Yeah. Um, most of the time it settles down and, and whether it's the injection or not, I honestly don't know, but that's a common referral point because I know in the past that me saying, look, there's lots of factors why this is flared up. And yes, you've got this ridiculous thing. Most of them settle down, blah, 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 blah. If I've left them before and they're like up to ED, just cut my head off because I can't mm -hmm. do this for another day, which is fair enough, you know? So having no, being aware of that, I might think that surgery for pain uh, isn't a good idea, but people are going to choose what they're going to choose. So having, that's a little caveat to my, you know, self-righteous this is what i do um, can you, if if that injection hasn't been effective can you use that as a a bit of a justification that maybe surgery will also not be effective uh may, again i i live in uncertainty so it might not be yeah. i can't i can't say it won't be because it just yeah. it is for some people but as to why it is that's another another question so lots of lots of people get interventions for pain and lots of people have positive results, but there is a massive just sea of suffering people that have had multiple interventions and they have all done two fifths of fuck all. Yeah. So when we're talking, when we're intervening with pain, we have to be aware of that, the iatrogenicness of what we do uh, and it, and the risks and the potential consequences of intervening. So I'm very skeptical of intervening for pain um that being said 
I, you know, doesn't mean I'm, you know, ultimately the, what the person is going to do, they're going to do. I just try and make it as, as informed a decision as, as I can help them. Yeah. Have you ever sent someone to a pain specialist? Um, no. <laughs> Sweet woman. <laughs> just not not worth it i have yeah if you want to hear your answer to this uh I, yeah would you rather send to a say a sports physician or a sports doctor first if there were if, if you had come to the point where i've done everything i can do within my scope followed all you know the evidence-based treatment and there wasn't anything more you could do how willing are you to let time go on before you then refer on to the next person because i know that's probably a a thing I've heard from the docs that we work with is people get held on to for too long without improvement. Mm -hmm. And then they come and see them six months later. I'm not saying this, this happens all the time, but an example they were telling me was like, a, it was a cancer in the bone and they've been treated with shin splints. Not saying that happens all the time, but there has to be a point, which is different for everyone where you say, okay, things aren't improving. I've tried everything I can. You need to go and see pain specialist, doc, GPs, or someone mm -hmm. more than me. I guess that's just to, to add to that quickly. I guess when we were previously talking about the difference between like pain and chronic pain patients, that that could be something that you consider as being different in terms of like how long you'd hold on to someone before you refer but on you to couldn't say that improvement. If it was three months and they had no improvement, you can't say, sweet, all right, now you've got chronic pain. No. So no. how would you different? Yeah, it's hard to well, you do, you do by definition because it's past three months. Yeah, it's just that like, nothing happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just a, so um, the, the difference in the story there is where am I in the story? So if, if they come and see me first and I'm helping them with a problem that's not getting better, 100%, I would send them to a vast array of specialists, rheumatologists, sports physicians, yeah. orthopedic specialists, all sorts of stuff. Podiatrists. I said specialists. <laughs> the, the current paradigm though is that pain management is last yeah so most of the time i this person comes to me after all of those have already ruled it they've had it sixteen thousand scans it i know that it's not anything red flaggy because they've had the scans yeah I like so that. so it's very different in terms of their journey if, 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 if you're the first person they've seen and it's not Oh look, you could you could be the first person they've seen and they've had it for ten years. That's very very unusual. Mm. If if someone's had something from for three months, they're probably going to ask someone for help. If you're the first person, and it my, one of my big rules is if it looks like a duck and sounds like a cow, then then that's a problem. So if shin splints should get better when you treat them, if they don't, then it might not be shin splints. Mm. So it's sounding like a cow. So, so go and get a scan. Same with back pain. Yeah. I, I know scans for back pain can make people worse, but if you're well, good management for back pain, it gets better. So if it's not getting better and it sounds like a cow, send them off. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's like that pendulum. Hey, of, cause I was under the impression, obviously I haven't seen many back. I've seen one back in my life and he didn't see me for very long. <laughs> that's the physio. But you know, I was just under the impression don't ever get a back scan because all the research says it's nocebic and you don't want to do it. It makes them worse. But understanding that obviously it swings the other way or sorry, swings back to the middle where there's definitely times where it is worth getting a scan. I, I think the pendulum is a bad model. Really? It creates, the, it creates the perception of a binary choice. So it's not that you either always scan or you never scan. But you can be in the middle, which is a combination of both. So it's not really... You know, yeah, but it, I, I, that's why I, I don't like model because it it's... Uh, maybe, well, uh, maybe I'm just being a bit pedantic, but it what, what happens is that most people gravitate to the edges. Yeah. So everything is grey, right? So mm -hmm. yes, and this is one of these paradoxes that I'm talking about. So scanning people that don't have pathology will probably make them worse, but not scanning people who do have pathology might make them dead. Mm. So picking one and sticking with it is, is not what it's about. It's about understanding what the, that evidence tells us. So if, if they have no signs of any red flaggy stuff and it's, you know, it's 
responding to pretty easy treatment and blah, 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 don't scan it. If it does that, but it's not responding to what you would think is normal, good treatment, then it's, it sounds like a cow. So then scan it. Just don't do it first. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the whole point of, of this podcast is because we've made these mistakes, I think, as, as young clinicians. And I think anyone that is a clinician, even like we said, it's for patients as well. But anyone that's a clinician can listen to this, I think, and realise that it is. Everything obviously is in the grey area, but especially as a young clinician, just something as, as simple as that. Mm. You just don't make the mistake and you don't have, I don't think we have, being a younger clinician myself, I think I'm getting better, but the idea to critically analyse everything that I see, and, I, and someone, if I read a study that says, you know, you shouldn't be scanning back pain, it makes them worse, I probably don't think about it enough to say, oh, but actually there's cases where we should and then develop my own mental model, my own framework mm. per se. So then th- conversations like this give me something to at least start with and hopefully all, all our listeners, because you've got the, like the Future Health Network, which is, kind of along those lines. I mean, how would you explain that? That's, I guess, a resource for people as well, which we'll link in, in this Spotify. That, that's our attempt. So myself and Justin Smith uh, from Achieve Podiatry and Connor Gledhill, who's a PhD student with Hunter New England Health and the uh, Centre for Population Health team. Anyway, can't remember. He's got too many letters after his name. Um, he'll probably, if he listens to this, he'll kick my ass after, but that's all right. He's a little <laughs> pussy. Um, uh, that's our attempt to, to, to make that better. Yeah. So there's a, there's a big gap in how uh, clinicians approach painful people. Mm. And I think clinicians are petrified, if I can keep using the alliteration, petrified of painful people. And they, they do things well intentionally that, possibly make people worse and it leads to this massive chronic problem that we that we have so that's our way of trying to help is to try and prevent it before it happens by helping people get better at what they do that's good it mm-hmm. definitely and uh, this is an irk of mine i see it all the time online people just hammer the universities and say they're crap they're shit they don't teach them about real world stuff you got to understand they obviously have a syllabus. They have a certain amount of time. There's only so much they can get in there. Don't get me wrong. It can't be done better. But if you don't think that all those incredibly intelligent academics are not trying to make it better, I think you, you've got issues. So I do think that they don't get, I guess, exposed as much at university. And this is why we, again, why we did the podcast, why we try and, I guess, direct people to things like the Future Health Network and we give good, I guess, good resources for people to look for. But yeah, it's just important that you, when you leave university, you continue with this kind of education because the universities don't feel it as well as I think they could. Yeah, I'm a bit more cynical. I think they should do a better job. Yeah, yeah. I agree. <laughs> but they, like how, I mean, this is the other thing. Like how would they do a better job? Uh, their funding models aren't geared towards outcomes. They're geared towards graduates. And what do, anyway. they, what do they cut out of the university? Oh, look, they're never going to be able to cover everything. You know, so, um, so oh, they're, oh, they're oh, always yeah. going to be limited, but they they could be lim- less limited is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, cool. Cool. Should we wrap it up, do you reckon? Yeah. We forgot to ask those questions at the, at the start, so we better ask them at the end. Okay, you- start and ask, ask them now. Oh, yeah, did you even answer the question? You thought it was your, you didn't even answer them. The, the thing that annoyed you this week. You, you didn't answer, you didn't ask me, sorry. I know, so we're I doing it answered. now, we're reversing. Flipping the thing that annoyed me this week was again a, a story of um, someone who who came into work who had had back pain for ten years. Uh, she'd been told that there was nothing else that she could do. She had scans that showed some bulging discs, and her understanding was that her lifting in her job was the cause of that problem. She'd retrained out of her job, which she really enjoyed. Wow. She'd stopped doing everything that that gave her meaning and per- not everything but social interaction and and meaning in her active life she'd become more anxious and withdrawn as a result mm. uh, and she I was I was the Hail Mary I was like this is it this is the last chance she she found out from a doctor that this is what I help people with um, and 100% of her story is avoidable mm. That's what annoys me. 
what that's, was... Yeah, it's like a case study. That's yeah. kind of like the exact reason we... It is a case study. Oh. I'm doing it on Instagram right. at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what is... It's the pain weapon is your plug, isn't it? The pain... Yep. Yeah, cool. Yeah, stay tuned for, for updates on that particular that's case. Right. <laughs> what was the thing that you learned this week? I'm very interested in causality and consequence and as a an older person compared to you who perhaps as a younger person on Sunday was not doing podcasts he was probably uh reeking the reaping the benefit lack of benefit of what he did the night before okay. I'm coming to understand that that consequence is a real uh burden of choices that we make so my the uh one of my musical heroes died at 50 yesterday or the day before so it was i'm 40 he's taylor hawkins is the drummer from the foo fighters mm. um and he was you know rock and roller and previous heroin addict and, and and i'm not saying that's what what contributed i've got no idea but it's um consequences is something that we never think about particularly when we're younger and it has a massive say in this this whole thinking of what we do and and the relative risk but the other side of it is it might be it might be low risk but if the consequence is massive we have to have some understanding of the effect of that and and certainly as younger clinicians we we never think of that certainly me as a young person i never thought of that ever um and i'm sure i'm sure taylor didn't either but yeah, that's... As, as you get older, you start thinking about it a lot more. So, pretty deep. Yeah, that was deep. Yeah, that was good. We haven't had our ones have been horrible compared to that. We'll have to start. Yeah, we'll have to up our game. Yeah, so horrible compared to that. Oh, oh, that's just real basic. Yeah. Ah, oh, right. Basic. Okay. But I like because you can just relate that to anything. Mm. You know, in the sense of I'm just rereading Atomic Habits at the moment, and they talk about the consequences of of not having to have all the consequences of not doing something that's going to benefit you in life, but you could also bring that across to, to patients as well. You know, the consequences you're giving. Consequences. Yeah. That is, that's it. We all, we all have an impulse to intervene. We all want to help people and make them better, but we have to understand the consequences of that intervention, both positive and negative. And it's not something that we're very good at individually or collectively. Mm. Yeah. Nice, good, great good stuff. All on. right, mate, we will let you go. What's on this week? What have you got going on? No idea. No idea. No. <laughs> so I'm trying not to make it, although I just referenced the person who died two days ago. So, I, But this this podcast is meant to be eternal, right? Like people will listen to this in 200 years and go, holy shit. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to make this quote. We're going to be number one. It's, it's weird because we're like, we're educational, but we're also health and fitness. But yeah, I don't know where we're going. We're going to be at the top of some chart. Well, now, you'll, now you'll cover the rock and roll one too. So. <laughs> Music education. Yeah, yeah, you'll you'll, you'll knock, off, knock off Joe Rogan. Yeah, is it stoicy? There was some stoic quotes in there too. So we'll yeah. probably go on that side, bit of self-development. Well. Uh, just all wrapped all in one pretty little bundle. <laughs> yes nice all right thanks dave. so much dave yes thank you and again we'll say it for the last time they can follow so future health network definitely mm-hmm. yep in weapon that's it awesome they're the only two things you probably ever need to follow in your life you could nearly say that's right awesome mate thank you for being on cool